Amen. You may be seated this morning. We know for a fact that our help does come from the Lord. Amen. And we appreciate Him for His mercy and for His goodness today as we um, go into His Word. I uh, ask that today you just allow the Lord to love you the way that He wants to love you. Allow Him to speak to your mind today in the course of the sermon. God is always looking for a way to help us and always looking for a way to minister to us and to touch us and to transform us and to change us. After all, that's why He came. He came and His message was changed. He changed us inside. And He wants to bring a newness to us. And He wants to help us to begin to understand how to serve God in a fallen world. That's not the easiest thing in the world to do is to serve God in a world that is in chaos around us and deteriorating around us and there's so many things pulling on us and if we're not careful, we get our eyes on the water, on the storm, like the disciples did instead of on Christ who was on the, on the ship. When Christ is on your ship, you don't have to look so much at the storm, you need to look at Him. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, that is a beautiful picture of the power that's in Christ. He took that storm and he took that opportunity to speak to us all of these generations later and he walked up on the bow of the boat and he told the storm to be still. And the Bible says the disciples were amazed at a man that the elements would actually obey him. But everything on planet earth obeys the Lord. Everything that's been created obeys him. I like that part because my adversary Satan was a created being. He wasn't created evil. He wasn't created bad. He was created an angel in heaven called the anointed cherub. He was beautiful. He was a blessing. He had all kind of instruments in him, but he decided that he wanted to fail God and wanted to exalt his throne above God. And when he did that or tried to do that, the Bible said, and we have that famous scripture, Jesus says, I beheld Satan as falling as light falling from heaven. That was his exit from heaven to planet earth. Well, that happened. Today, I want to talk to you about and preach to you about the power of praise. I'm always excited when the song services or the worship service goes with my sermon, and they don't even know what my sermon is. That always excites me that I've heard from the Lord. And I want to talk to us today about the power of praise. Praise is a powerful weapon in the hand of every believer. Yet we do so little of it. Did you know that praise is mentioned more in the Bible than prayer is? Yet we have prayer meetings, all-night vigils, prayer conferences, and all of these things are good. Nothing wrong with them, and we should, in fact, do those. They're in line with Scripture. I just think we're missing a link in our prayer time. Maybe we should add an element of praise when we pray. We spend all of our time asking God to do something, but it might be good if we would just spend a portion of our time giving God praise. After all, have you read the prayer of the Lord, the Lord's Prayer, we call it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13? Let's look at that. It begins with an element of praise, and it ends with an element of praise. And this is what the disciples came, and they asked the Lord, Lord, how should we pray? And he says, after this manner you ought to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The word hallowed means we're giving him worship, we're worshiping him. So when we begin to go to the Lord in prayer, we need to begin to go to him and to worship him. The very first thing that should come out of our mouth instead of Lord I need is Lord I worship you today because of the beauty of holiness. I worship you because of the power that is in your hand. I worship you today because you delivered me and set me free. And then you follow with all the other stuff that you have need of. Then it begins to talk about your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us. Give us doesn't start to way down in the scripture. But we start give us at the beginning of our prayers. Did you notice that? A lot transpires before we get to the give us. Our Father... In heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We begin to worship God and to praise God. And then, 
After we've done all of that, then we begin to tell him our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. That scripture, we don't just want to pray that verse, but we begin to add all the things in that we need. God, I need a job. I need my marriage fixed, my children. I need finances. I need this or I need that. We begin to tell God, give us these things. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Somebody owe you a debt. I'm not talking about a dollar bill. Someone's hurt your feelings and you owe them a debt of forgiveness. And forgive us our debts. Forgive us all the horrible things that we've done to you as we forgive the horrible things that people have done to us. One of the hardest, two of the hardest things in Scripture for us to get a handle on is obedience and forgiveness. We struggle with the fact that we need to forgive people. In fact, we're mandated to forgive people. And we're mandated to obey God. Forgiveness is a tough place to be because we take it and internalize it so much. But we are to forgive those who have, are debtors to us. And when someone offends you, they're a debtor. But we look at that. That's probably not the best language that the writers could have chosen there when they translated that. They might have, should have picked another language. And in some places, you can find other wording. Forgive us our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for yours. And then he begins to go right back into praise. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We go from praise to praise. And we fit in the middle of that. If we would learn to begin to praise God, how much more power God would begin to release in our life to confuse and to destroy the enemy that is working overtime in us. There are several points you need to remember about praise. Come on, Holy Spirit, and help us in this place today. I want people to get a hold of this power, and I bind up everything of the adversary that would try to hinder. Praise pulls down strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. The Bible tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of darkness, the age of the age, against spiritual hosts and of wickedness in heavenly places. When was the last time that you punched a spiritual, spiritual wickedness in high places in the face? When was the last time you absolutely did that? You do that by learning to praise the name of the Lord God. You do that begin, by beginning to call on His name and exalt His name above all the names of the other. When you do that, you punch the adversary in the face. I find it interesting that the very thing that Satan wanted, which was praise, God uses to punch him in the face with. The very thing that Satan wanted was praise. The Bible said when he was created, he was created a fearful and wonderful. He was created uh, sitting behind the throne of God. And on his vesture, he had all the music instruments. He had vowels and pipes and stringed instruments. He was a gifted musician. And he had, uh, he had all kinds of things going on in him. He was beautiful to look at. He had sardis and gold and, and uh, uh, all kinds of jewelry on him. He was beautiful. And he was so beautiful and he was so anointed that he said, You know what I want? I want to exalt my name or my throne above the throne of God. He wasn't created evil, so he wanted praise, but he didn't get praise. He got thrown out. So the very thing that the adversary wants, God uses to torment him with. When we begin to praise the name of the Lord, it brings confusion to the adversary. And he doesn't know which way to go. And he begins to run to the left and to the right simply because somebody has dared to begin to praise the name of the Lord. Now look at this verse of Scripture. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Praise is a weapon that can, we can use through all the havoc that the enemy brings in our life. But we haven't learned to do that yet. We are accustomed to only praising God when something good happens. But we should praise God. Our praise should not be confined to just the good times. But we should learn to praise God at all times. Paul said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in four areas. They pull down strongholds. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you know what a stronghold is? A stronghold, those of you that's been in the military know what a stronghold is. It is a fortified position from which you can defend anything. 
It is a fortified position that military men like to be in called a stronghold that you can defend easily. When they taught us, the stronghold was high ground. You always wanted to get to high ground because if you got to high ground, you had an opportunity over your adversary. And let me tell you something. This scripture here says that we have the power to pull down the strongholds of the enemy. And friend, don't make a mistake. He does set up strongholds in our lives. He sets up things in our life from where he wars from, from where he fights from, from where he takes advantage of us, from where he gets a hold in our life. But the Bible says that a weapon of praise can pull this stronghold down and the enemy cannot take care of us or it hit us when we pull down his strongholds if we can learn to do that a stronghold is different for every person what works on one person may not work on another but you know what works on you casting down arguments it casts down arguments have you ever had the enemy argue with you yeah he'll argue with you and tell you that God does not love you that you can't do this that you're not worthy And on and on the arguments in your mind go. But the Bible says that God will help us to cast down these arguments. And it casts down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And it brings every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. When we begin to praise God, it begins to bring all of that stuff in and narrow it down. Praise is the weapon that can penetrate the hardest heart and bring liberty in a man's life. Or a woman's life. I read a story by uh, by a man by the name of Terry Law, and he wrote this in his book, uh, "Praise or Power: The Power of Praise and Worship." Uh, He was ministering in Russia with his singing group called Living Sound. Some of you may remember Living Sound back in the '70s. Some of you will not remember that, but some of us may remember Living Sound back in the '70s. The group was booked to sing in a nightclub in Russia, full of 200 members of the Youth Communist Party. He had been given Strictly forbidden to say anything about the gospel. He agreed and stood in the back while his group started the concert. Halfway through, the singers began to worship God with their hands raised in praise. Several of them were crying as they stood in the presence of the Almighty God. God moved so mightily in that meeting, as a result of it, they stayed till 3.30 a.m. in the morning, leading the young communist to Jesus Christ. There is power in praise. Praise brings great liberty into our lives when we begin to worship God. Praise brings deliverance. If you're suffering and you're struggling and you're in prison, praise brings deliverance. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 31 is a, is a powerful proof of that. And right now in this room, I know that some of us are struggling or some of you are struggling with some things in your life. But I want to tell you something. God has the power to deliver you from anything that you're struggling from. And you need to understand that. This is a powerful story. It's a simple story. And and the writers of the scripture tell it in such simplicity so that we can get it and magnify it and place it over our lives. We need to take it sometimes and place this verse of scripture over our life. This is what happened in this story. Acts chapter 16 is the story of Paul and Silas going about the city of the city of Philippi and they're preaching the gospel and as they're preaching the gospel in this city there's this young lady that follows him around and she is full of demons and she's a fortune teller and she actually has power from Satan to tell the future and she's following Paul and Silas around and she keeps saying this these men are of the God most high And after about three or four days of her following them around, the apostle Paul gets very frustrated with her and he turns around and he tells the spirit. He doesn't address the girl, but he addresses the spirit and he tells the spirit, come out of her. And the Bible says the spirit came out of her and as a result of that, these people that owned her made a lot of money off of her and as a result of the spirit coming out of their income decreased and so they had a a big uproar and they go and they take Paul and they take Silas And they beat them with a whip, and they beat them for 39 stripes on each of them's back. Now, the way they did that is they pulled their clothes off, they tied them to a post, and they beat them. Then after they beat them, they took them and they put them in jail, and they put them in chains, and they put them in stocks. Now, this is the picture you need to get of Paul and Silas. They're laying in the bottom of a jail, and it wasn't a jail like we have here today. It was a filthy, stinking place. It is where all of the excrement from the people that lived above flowed down into this basement area where the prison was. And here's Paul and Silas. They've been beaten and they're laying in there and they got chains on them and they got stocks on them. 
Now, the way the, they did stocks is they forced your legs apart as far as they could get them, and they would take a stick, and they would shove it between you so you couldn't close your legs back up. And there lay Paul and Silas in this predicament. And let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 16 now. And I want to go just, John, if we could, let's just go to the 25th verse and pick it up in verse number 25. This is beautiful. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and praising. They were singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. So that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened from his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, and was getting ready to commit suicide. The apostle Paul told him, don't do that. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, do yourself no harm, we're all still here. Now look at the deliverance that came. Not only was Paul and Silas delivered, but that Philippian jailer also and his entire household was saved because somebody in that place dared to begin to praise God. We only praise God in the good times. Paul and Silas learned to praise God. When things were going contrary to their life, they began to sing praises. But we can't praise until everything is going wonderful. But they began to praise. Let me tell you something. Paul and Silas were not in good shape. They were hurting and they were crying, but they began to sing, Tony. I don't know. I, I think they sung uh, Prayer Rails of Heaven. I don't know. You think they might have sung that? <laughs> At least that's what the song says. Remember that song? Paul and Silas both were thrown in jail, but they did not worry who would go their bell. But on the prayer bells, they began to ring and off fell their stocks and they began to sing Prayer Bells of Heaven. Oh, how sweet the sound. My goodness, if we would begin to learn to praise God in our tough times and in our good times, I promise you, God will begin to perform miracles in your life. They were in prison. They didn't know if they were going to live or not. But let me tell you, when they began to sing, the Bible said the chains fell off and they began to, to rejoice and they began a prayer meeting and they'd been an evangelistic crusade and people were saved because somebody dared praise God. You see, we can't just praise God when everything's going good. But that's when we praise Him. It's called testimony. I want to give God a testimony. And we get up and tell, tell about all the good stuff He's done in our lives. And praise God for all the good things He's done in our life. But we fail to praise God when we're going through the tough times. The Bible says that we're to praise God at all times. Not just at some times, but every time. We're to give praise to God. Praise is a weapon of warfare. Praise can cause the walls to fall down in your life. Remember the story of Joshua when he was marching around the walls of Jericho. The Bible said they were getting ready to go into this very first city in the new land. Just as Joshua got ready to go into the land that God had promised to them, and they got ready to go over there, they had a problem. In the middle of that was this fortified city called Jericho. It was the first city. It was the largest city. It was a city that had high walls and wide walls, so big that two chariots could pass on the top of them. There was no way to penetrate it, and God gave them a battle plan. You see, sometimes we want a battle plan that we want to design. And God said, let me design a battle plan to get in this city for you. And God told them this story. Now, if you were a military man... I can just see me as a Marine, the commander telling me, this is how we're going to overcome this adversary. We're going to sing them to death. <laughs> we're going to sing them to death. Does that, say, does that, make, that doesn't make sense to a Marine. We're told to break things. I mean, they tell us in there, your job is to hurt people and break things. And here they are. God's getting given them a new battle plan. This is the battle plan. You're going to sing them to death. I want you to march around this city every day, once a day for seven days. And then after you've marched around it like that, I want you just not to say a word. I just want you to go back and go to sleep, have lunch. And on the seventh day, I want you to march around it seven times. And when you've completed the seventh time, I want you to begin to give a shout of praise. And the Bible said they did what God told them to do, and they began to shout of praise. And the Bible said the walls fell down flat into the ground. 
They didn't fall outwards. They didn't fall inwards. They just went down in the ground like an elevator. And we see it on TV. They show it a little different from that. But the Bible says it just went flat. The Bible just says it just fell down flat. And, and they walked into the city and took the city. Jericho fell down flat because God told them how to get the battle, how to win the battle. Praise can stop a fiery furnace. Ask the three Hebrew children, Shadmach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible said because they praised God, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. Because they refused to praise the king when they heard the music. They refused to bow down. They said, we will not bow down to this, but we will praise the king of glory. We will praise him. And did you know what happened when the Bible says they took those Hebrew children and they threw them into the fiery furnace? And as they were walking in the fiery furnace, the king said, did we not throw three down in there? I see a fourth one, and he has the Son of God. Let me tell you, when they began to praise God, it got God's attention, and he told Jesus, there are some of your children down there in the fire. And the Bible said that he leaped over the balcony of heaven and began to walk in that fiery furnace and deliver those children of Israel because they dared praise God and said we will praise him with everything that's in us even if the king kills us we will praise him no matter what happens we will give him praise some of us need to learn to get our praise on and to begin to praise God in the middle of the storm we need to begin to shout and to rejoice regardless of what's happening we need to tell the story I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I've been delivered and I've been set free. That's enough to praise him about. Amen. If he does nothing else, I got something to praise him about. Praise can stop the lion's mouth. Some of you Christians are going to need to learn that. Because a lion has got his mouth open on planet earth. Some of you, if you're not careful, are going to get gobbled up at work. You think the adversary's not there? You think he don't, he, he, that he, he's happy with you and all that you're doing? He's not happy with you. Praise can stop the mouths of the lion. Ask Daniel. Daniel was thrown in a lion's den because of his practice. Three times a day he went up and he would begin to praise God and to pray. And began to talk to God. And they had made a decree. They said we're going to fix this guy. We're going to stop him from praying. You think the adversary don't want to stop you from praying today? That's why some of us go through so much havoc. We haven't learned the art of praising God at all times. We haven't learned the art of praising God in the good times and the bad times. We can only praise him when there's enough money in the bank. When our car's working. When our family's in good shape. But you let us get in another position. And we begin to tell God how much he doesn't love it. Let me tell you something. Your circumstance does not change the love of God to you one bit we need to learn to praise him and to give honor to his name and watch God close the mouth of the lion Daniel fell down in that in that den and the next morning when the king came and they opened that door to see what had happened to Daniel I like the words he said oh Daniel is your God continually able to deliver you? And the answer back was, oh, king, my God. Somebody ought to shout when he looked back up at the king and said, oh, king, my God has sent an angel and shut the lions in the mouth. Let me tell you, God can close the lion's mouth today in your life, on your job, wherever you're at. He can close the lion's mouth. I get excited when I read what God can do because he is still in charge. The adversary thinks he's not in charge on planet, that God's not in charge on planet earth. And sometimes we act like and live like that there's not a God. But I tell you, the world powers need to know that he is still on his throne and nothing happens except by his permission. All that they're doing is by his permission. When we look at all that's going on in the Middle East and we get nervous and excited, you need to read the book. All that battle of Armageddon is going to come. The Bible says he's going to take a hook and put it in the jaw of the king of the north. I ain't going to tell you where the king of the north is. Some of you already know that. And the Bible says he's going to hook him in the jaw and he's going to pull him to the battle. 
whether he wants to come or not. Yes, indeed, God's going to draw him in. You think that battle takes God by surprise? He already prophesied about it long before any of us got here, long before the countries were divided. God had already set this thing in motion. There's going to be a, a great adversary come and a great disturbance on the earth, and we need to know we need to keep on praising God regardless of what's happening. Because praise is a powerful weapon in the hands of the Christian. When we learn to praise God and not always be asking God for something all the time, we learn to praise Him. Look at the Lord's Prayer. It begins with praise and ends with praise and you don't get anything to the middle. The middle is a great place to be. I mean in Psalms 23, you find yourself in the middle of goodness and mercy. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me how long? All the days of my life. Every time you look back, you ought to see goodness and mercy walking right behind you. I get that mental picture in my mind that when I look back, goodness and mercy is following me. I'm expecting goodness and mercy to come upon me. I'm expecting God to show some kind of goodness. And God is expecting me to do what He has called me to do. To preach the gospel, to defend the gospel. He has called me to praise Him. If I don't get to do anything else on planet Earth, God has called me to praise Him and to lift His name above every name. And when I begin to do that, surely goodness and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life. If I'm in the lion's den, goodness and mercy is in the lion's den too. And if I'm in the fiery furnace, I got somebody walking in that furnace with me. Did you read the story? Well, that's the only time I see it. How many times do you have to see it? How many times do you have to read it? I mean, good Lord, if he told us over and over and over again, you know how big the book would be? I mean, have you not read that he said there was a lot of things that the book just wouldn't contain it? Tony, the book wouldn't contain the goodness of God. We got a Bible. We need to take it for what it is or read it for what it is and let God, the Holy Spirit, begin to lead us and guide us and direct us and expand it. When I read these stories in the Bible, I see all kinds of things happening in my life. God will push things out of the way for you. He will push things out of the way and make room for you where there seems to be no room. Have you read that scripture? When they they were fighting over the wells and they dug some new wells in the Bible, Jacob and them were digging wells and carrying on and they were fussing and fighting about the, the wells and then they dug the last well and they named it Room Enough. God's made room enough for us. You think God won't make room for you in this world that we're living in? God will make room for you. He'll make room for you on that job. He'll make room for you in that board meeting. He'll make room for you wherever you're at. God will make room for you. I know this man right here. I've watched God in Tony's life make room for him in companies that should not have hired him. But God made room for him. He could quit a job today and have a job tomorrow. It's the only man, him, I'm the only guy I ever know who could do that. He can quit today and have a job tomorrow because God makes room for him. I've known him for 25 years, and I've watched God make room for him in this company, in that company, in this company. I, I've followed him around. He, you know, and, and seen where he is. Where are you working now, Tony? I'm working over here. Where are you working now? I'm working over here. Where are you, I'm working over here. I'm, he just goes wherever. He, he just goes. Because God makes room for him. He believes that. It's not because he's special, simply because he believes that God will make room for him. In his mind somewhere, he's beginning to believe that God will make room for him. Let me tell you, we need to begin to believe that God will make room for us. And when we learn to praise God, God will begin to close the mouth of lions. He will begin to sustain us in the fiery furnace. And he will tear down the walls that the enemy builds around us. But we got to learn to praise him and to give him honor. Praise can stop the appetites of anything. Any lion, nothing can hurt you. Praise infuses the energy of God and confuses the enemy of God. When you begin to praise God in the middle of your storm, it confuses the enemy. He doesn't know what in the world you're doing. There's a story about that in in, in 2 Chronicles. Chapter 20, it's the story of King Jehoshaphat. We read about and we talk about it, but we miss the point. We miss some of the power that's in that verse of Scripture. When we look at that verse of Scripture, we miss some of the great power that's there. We know that when they begin to sing that God routed the enemy, but we don't know why He routed the enemy. It's because when they begin to sing, God confused them. And they killed each other. 
they literally killed each other. And the next morning when Israel got up and went over the hill, the Bible said they saw dead bodies everywhere. I like the latter part of that. It said it took them three days to collect all the jewelry and gold that the enemy left. Isn't that amazing? Read that story, it's crazy. It took them three days to gather all the gold. God killed all of them in one day and took the, the children of Israel three days to gather everything up. Let's read that story. And Jehoshaphat feared. He got news that there were three kings, several kings coming to kill him. And the Bible said he was afraid. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered the people together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. In other words, God, you see this mess that I'm in. What does the Bible say about acknowledging God in all your ways? And he would direct your paths. We need to acknowledge him when we get ready to, if you're not married, when you get ready to have marry, you need to acknowledge him. Consult him. You need to acknowledge him when you're getting get your job. You need to acknowledge him when you're having good time. You need to acknowledge him when, you, when you're facing an enemy. Acknowledge God and ask God what to do before you hire the lawyer. Because God may just save you some money. They're afraid and things are getting pretty crazy. And they don't know what to do. So the Bible said they prayed and they fasted and they consulted of the Lord. And they asked God, God, what should we do? God gave them direction. Let's look at verse 13, or excuse me, verse 14 through 17. Verse 14 through 17 tells us what God told them to do. Let me just, I'll be faster to grab it here, I think. Verse 14, then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Manad, a Levite, the son of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation, and he said, hearken Ye all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of the great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. We fight a lot of battles that's not ours, simply because we don't acknowledge Him and go ask Him what He wants us to do. Tomorrow you go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the cliff of Ziz, and you shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jehurel. You shall not need to fight in the battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Verse 20 says, They rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tokia. <clears throat> and as they went, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted the people, he appointed singers. And they went out before the presence of the army. And the Bible said they began to sing. And when they began to sing, God set ambushments against the enemy. And they be, he began to torment their minds, and they thought each other was the enemy, and they began to attack each other, and every last one of them was killed. For the children of Ammon, Moab, stood against the inhabitants of Seir. They began to fight each other. They began to destroy each other. When you begin to praise God, it confuses the enemy. They got confused and began to attack each other and to destroy each other. And when Jeho verse 25, And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoils, they found among them in the abundance both riches and with the dead bodies and precious jewels with them that stripped off themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering all the stuff. Not only did God destroy the enemy, but he gave them gold and jewelry and riches. What a blessing for simply praising the Lord. What an amazing God we serve today. That if we will learn to praise him, he will begin to do great and mighty things for us. Praise is a powerful weapon to the church, and sometimes we forget that. Psalms 34, 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. 
How many of you have ever read the Psalms and just tried to count how many times it says praise the Lord? I will give praise to the Lord. It is, it is just redundant, just throughout that verse of Scripture. How should we praise Him? We should praise Him personally and at all times, in the good times and in the bad times. We should praise Him verbally. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Psalms 156, or excuse me, 150, verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. In the midst of your circumstances, in the middle of your confusion, in the middle of your crisis, there is power in your praise. We need to praise Him because He is almighty, because He blessed us, He cares for us, He delivers us, He erased the penalty of sin that was against us. You come to the music, Chris. He forgave us. He gave me us eternal life. He hears us when we cry to Him. We should praise Him because He loves us, because He never leaves us, because He has redeemed us, because He took our place at Calvary. We should learn to praise God at all times and in all situations and watch the power of God begin to show up in our lives and begin to minister. We need to learn to praise God at the very best and very height of our life. And we need to learn to praise God when we're in the darkest, deepest place that we can ever go. There is a God who will sustain us and help us and minister His grace to us. There's a God who loves us beyond measure. That has never forsaken us and never will forsake us. His promise is to go with us to the end of the world. To the end of the age. What an amazing God we serve. In this room today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that is the single greatest need that you have. You need Christ in your life. You need to ask Him to forgive your sins and to come into your heart and to wash you clean. Anybody in this room today, you have not accepted Christ and you'd like to do that, you'd like to invite Him into your heart, just slip your hand up. Anybody in this room with me today? All over the building, would you stand with me this morning? If you're here today and you're in a crisis, the enemy has been loosed on you and you're being attacked from every side and you need deliverance and you need help, God is here today to bring that help to you. He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. And you do not have to go through your life living beneath the privilege as a son or daughter of God. If you need prayer this morning for anything that's going on in your life, I'm going to invite you to come. If you need God to bring deliverance and wholeness to you, I'm going to ask you to come. God is a deliverer and a restorer. He will bring hope. He will bring peace. And He will bring grace. When you learn how to praise Him at all times, praise Him when everything is going wonderful, Praise Him when everything is not going so wonderful. Praise Him when your marriage is on top of the mountain. Praise Him when your marriage is in the lowest valley. If you will just learn to praise Him and to give Him honor and to give Him glory, God will begin to show up and show out in your life. Tom, come on. We need to let God be who God is. He is all-powerful and all-knowing. If you're here this morning and and you need God to help you in your life, I'm going to challenge you to come. If you want God to bring deliverance and hope, I'm going to challenge you to come. Come and let God minister His grace to you. Come and let God give you direction. Come and let Him speak to your mind. Come let Him speak to your spirit. Come let Him bring wholeness and help to you. If we could get some more people to come help us pray today. There is a God. Worship as we pray with these that are coming today. Jesus.